I would like to welcome you all to my native habitat garden based in Point Cook. I built my house in 2002 in a brand new developed estate. There was nothing but dirt for kilometres and there were barely any trees, let alone wildlife. I always had a passion for flora and fauna, but I was particularly attracted to natives. I knew that if I wanted to attract the birds, insects, mammals and reptiles, and even the amphibians, that I would have to create a habitat that was suited to their needs. So it was not difficult to make the decision to go native and more importantly, indigenous. So my journey began with lots of trial and error. And in the first five years, the majority of the plants that we had planted actually died. And this was the result of Victoria being in one of the worst droughts ever recorded at the time. But I pushed on and the first priority was to lay down some grass to keep the dirt under control. And it gave my young children a surface that was safe and soft underfoot. Then the trees started to go in along the fence line to create some shade on the house. And the first were eucalyptus trees. Two of them survived and are still standing today, proud, big and very tall. And they are the draw cards for the birds and the flying foxes. The next area I focused on was where my reptiles live now, as I had pet turtles and lizards that had moved from one house to another until I built this home. So in went the ponds and the plants to provide my pets with as natural habitat as possible. In this next section, I have two ponds, so my nine turtles have choices as to where they prefer to swim. They have lots of space to sunbake during the warmer weather, as they spend most of their time out on land during the sunnier days. I have my blue tons, so I added grasses, hollow logs, slate slabs and mulch, so they had a space that resembled their natural habitat as well. Plant-wise, I added lots of dwarf gums, more grevilleas, ground covers, lots of dianella to attract the blue-banded bees, and native wildflowers to fill in the gaps. And this area is now thriving, as are my turtles and lizards. I then started to move to the rest of the yard, chopping out grass patches as I went along, and I added in two new frog bogs, so the frogs had somewhere to stay. Holes were dug, and initially I had pond liner, but this soon failed with roots perforating the liner. So I opted to use prefabricated molded ponds and have used them ever since. I planted out all the bogs and filled them with water, and I refill them when they run low from my water tank. Within months, frogs arrived and they have never left. As each section became more established, the trees grew more and more, and as a result, the roots aerated and nourished the soil, improving the ground for the next lot of trees to go in. I added shrubs and flowering plants so I could start attracting the birds, and at that point, grevilleas were proving to be their favourites. My garden was soon filling fast with trees and shrubs, so I moved on to ground covers and salt bushes to add further layers to my habitat. These plants filled the gaps, and within no time I had no lawn at all. No more mowing every weekend, no more watering or fertilising. My garden is truly sustainable, requiring very minimal watering or even weeding for that matter. I only water the newest sections that have been planted in the last 12 months, as well as my native orchids and my vegetable patch. The leaves and bark that come off my eucalypts and casuarinas make natural mulch. This keeps the soil damp and prevents weeds from popping up. By keeping the soil damp, 
the worms and earth-moving insects thrive too, and they do their job to break matter down and nourish the trees. This cycle is well balanced now in my garden. This is my more recent alteration to my habitat garden, and I am now focusing on indigenous wildflowers in this specific section. The wildflowers I have here are chocolate and vanilla lilies, native buttercups, mostral storkbills, billy buttons, pussy tails, native mint, bulbines, and basalt daisies. I have plant guards around them because they die off after flowering and I did not want to lose where they were. They also seed prolifically, so by having the plant guards around them, I can contain the seeds better and spot where new seedlings pop up, making it easier when I propagate them. With this section, I hope to see more native butterflies and insects, as I have noticed in the last two years that there have been more and more coming through. I have also done mass plantings of Dianella, and the reason for this is because I have found they attract blue banded bees. When they flower, I have a large purple patch, and this is exactly what blue banded bees love. Every year now, I have over a dozen blue banded bees coming to my garden, and their numbers are growing each season. This area has only been established in the last four years. As prior to this, I had chickens. What I didn't realise is how amazing the soil would become because the chickens aerated it and fertilised it the entire time. In this section, I have done a mass planting of native grasses and in particular Themida, as I wanted to attract the golden sun moth into my garden. I have started to see the very occasional one and would be wrapped to attract a whole lot more. I also added lots of native tobacco and this has started to self-seed, so more are appearing each year without any effort whatsoever. Amongst these shrubs, I have various tussock grasses and this beautiful hardened verdure that is currently in full flower and a big attraction for the New Holland honey eaters and the superb fairy wrens. In the background, you can see I also have fruit trees, so you can create a habitat garden that can serve more than one purpose. It doesn't have to be strictly indigenous. In fact, the native birds come in and clean up the parasites in the fruit trees, which means I don't have to use any form of pesticide. Nature does it for me. Here we are entering the front yard, and as you can see, I was not going to just plant up the back. I needed the garden to flow and continue to as far as I could go. I added in another frog bog to the front and added in a lot of grevilleas, more dwarf eucalypts, wattles, corias, bottle brushes, salt bushes, and more grasses. During the summer, my bedroom would become unbearably hot as I had the afternoon sun penetrate the windows. Since the front has become more established, my bedroom is now shaded and no longer becomes an oven. I also have birds roosting and nesting in the trees all the time, and there are always bursts of colour as well as fragrance from the blossoms. Moving along, my nature strip was not immune from my habitat obsession. Here I have planted more dwarf eucalypts, wattles and flowering shrubs. I also added in salt bushes to cover the ground and have more recently added in native mint, so when you step on it you get bursts of amazingly strong minty aromas. Late last year I decided to dig up part of my nature strip as it was compacted and drab and instead I dug out a trench and created a swale. This fills with water naturally when it rains to create a semi-dry creek bed. I planted more Themida and Nobly Rush in the wet parts and interestingly, Canidia running postman has popped up on its own, as well as the nodding saltbush. So this entire area will soon knit up. 
Since the swale went in, I have found more birds foraging around, especially the crested pigeons and the thornbills, and the ravens as well. And this is partly because of the insects now found in the damp soil, as well as the little berries produced by the salt bushes. The majority of my native habitat garden has been established in the last 10 years, so it doesn't take a long time to get to this point. It just requires some careful planning from the beginning, making good plant choices, getting your hands dirty, and then some patience. Then all you need to do is sit back and enjoy as the wildlife makes its way back into your garden. I hope you enjoyed your virtual tour of my native habitat garden and have found some ideas that will inspire you to start your own.